From time to time, in the course of the world's history, the title of great has been given to some monarch who has distinguished himself, either by the splendor of his victories or by the value of his services to his fellow men. We speak, for example, of Alexander the Great and, amongst English kings, of Alfred the Great. There was, however, one empire, that of Persia, in which the title of great carried with it no distinction, for in this country every king was called the great king, not because it was supposed that his nature was more noble or his actions more splendid than those of other men, but because he was lord of a vast empire, greater than had ever yet been seen upon the face of the earth. The Persian Empire had been founded about a hundred and fifty years before the time of this story, by Cyrus the Great, who, having succeeded by inheritance to the double throne of Persia and Media, had conquered many of the surrounding nations. The kings who came after him extended their sway farther and farther, until at last, in the time of Darius I, there were no less than fifty-six countries subject to the great king of Persia. The great king was looked upon as little less than a god. Everyone who entered his presence threw himself flat upon the ground, as if in the presence of a divine being. It was supposed that a mere subject must of necessity be struck to the earth with sudden blindness on meeting the dazzling rays of such exalted majesty. The court of the great king was on a scale of the utmost splendor. His chief residence was the city of Susa, but in the hot season he preferred the city of Ecbatna, which was higher and cooler, and he also stayed occasionally at Babylon and at Persepolis. At each of these places there was an immense palace, adorned with every conceivable magnificence, and from the discoveries recently made among the ruins of Persepolis we can form some idea of what the palace of the great king of Persia must have been like. The palace of Persepolis stood upon a terrace above the rest of the city, and all around it were houses of a simpler kind, used for lodging the soldiers and the civil and military officers who were attached to the king's person, and who ate daily at his expense. There must, in all, have been about 15,000 of them, including the 10,000 soldiers of the royal bodyguard. The gate of the palace was approached by two superb flights of marble stairs, which joined in front of the entrance and were so wide that ten horsemen could ride abreast up each side. Within the gate was a square building with a front of more than 200 feet. The entrance hall was a magnificent room, with a roof supported by a hundred pillars of richly carved stone, and on either side of it were other rooms with beautiful pillars. In all directions lovely colors and ornaments of gold and silver met the eye. The walls were covered with gigantic sculptures, representing the great kings Darius I and Xerxes, who had built the palace, with attendants, both in time of peace, and at war with monsters and wild beasts. Together with the sculptures were inscriptions which can be read even now. This is a translation of the beginning of one of them, I am Darius, the great king, the king of kings, the king of these many countries. Among the sculptures is one that represents Darius seated on his throne, with a slave standing behind him, holding in his hand a fan with which to keep off the flies. The mouth of the slave is covered with a bandage, for it would have been considered a profanation to allow the air breathed by so august a sovereign to be polluted by the breath of a slave. Another sculpture represents an audience given to an ambassador, who, for the same reason, holds his hand before his mouth in the presence of the king. When the great king gave an audience, he sat upon a golden throne with a canopy above him which was held in its place by four slender pillars of gold adorned with precious stones. The whole effect was so dazzling that it would be hard to imagine anything more splendid, even in a fairy tale. On these occasions, and on all feast days, the king appeared in a purple robe, with a magnificent mantle of the same purple color, richly embroidered. Around his waist was a golden girdle, and from it there hung a golden saber, glittering with precious stones. On his head was the tiara, a sort of pointed cap worn by the Persians. Only the king might wear his tiara standing upright, all subjects were obliged to press down the point or arrange the cap in some other way. The color of the royal tiara was blue and white, and it was encircled with a golden crown. It was only on rare occasions that the king walked, and then only within the precincts of the palace. On these occasions, carpets were spread before him, on which no foot but his might tread. When he rode beyond the palace, the right of helping him into his saddle was bestowed as a mark of great distinction upon one of the most highly favored lords of the empire. More frequently, however, 
the king preferred to drive in his chariot, and at these times the road he intended to take was specially cleansed and strewn with myrtle as if for a festival and filled with clouds of incense. It was lined, moreover, with armed men on both sides, and guards with whips prevented any approach to the royal chariot. If a distant journey had to be undertaken, no less than twelve hundred camels and a whole multitude of chariots, wagons, and other means of transport were required to convey the great king, his countless attendants, and his endless baggage. At a distance of about two miles from Persepolis was a great pile of marble rock, and here Darius I caused his tomb to be made whilst he was yet alive. So steep and inaccessible was the cliff that the only way of placing the body in the tomb prepared for it was by raising it from below with ropes. Afterwards, three other royal tombs were hewn out of the same rock, and three more in another, not far off. All Persians were allowed to have many wives, and the great king had often a very large number, Darius, for example, had three hundred and sixty, almost as many as there are days in the year. Yet only one of these was the queen, all the rest were so far beneath her that, when she approached, they had to bow themselves to the ground before her. Like all Persians, the king only ate once a day, but the meal lasted a very long time. He sat at the center of the table, upon a divan framed in gold and covered with rich hangings. At his right hand was the queen mother, at his left, the queen consort. The princes and intimate friends of the king, who were called his table companions, usually took their meal in an adjoining room. On feast days, however, they were permitted to dine in the royal presence, and, on these occasions, seats made of cushions or carpets were placed for them upon the floor. The power of the great king was bounded by no law, from his will there was no appeal. He was a despot in the strictest sense of the word, and his subjects were all alike his slaves, from the lowest to the highest, not even excepting his nearest relations. In the whole world there was only one person whom he was required to treat with any kind of respect, this was his mother. Under the vigorous rule of Darius I, the empire of Persia had attained its utmost limits. At that time, fifty-six subject countries offered tribute to the great king. But from this moment it gradually declined in power and in extent. For the wisest head and the strongest arm it would have been no easy task to govern such a dominion, and the successors of Darius were neither wise nor strong. Neither was the Persian nation what it had been in the time of the great Cyrus, when even the nobles were simple in their habits and when every Persian made it his pride to ride well, to shoot well, and always to speak the truth. Now, nobles and people alike had become luxurious and pleasure-loving, caring for nothing but to increase their own power and wealth, no matter at what cost to the subject nations. The empire was unwieldy in size, and moreover it lacked any real bond of union. The various nations of which it was composed differed in language, in manners, and in habits of life. Each province was interested in its own local affairs, but was profoundly indifferent to the fate of the empire at large, and in time of war the soldiers were so little inclined to risk their lives for a monarch of whom they knew nothing that they only fought under compulsion and often had to be driven with whips to face the enemy. In order to provide for the government of the empire, it was subdivided into provinces, and each province, or group of two or more provinces, was placed under the charge of one of the great lords. It was the duty of these governors, or satraps, as they were called, to act as the representative of the sovereign, to maintain law and order, and to take care that the people had no opportunity of revolting from their subjection to the great king. The power of the satraps was practically absolute, and a thoroughly disloyal satrap could even go so far as to seize some favorable opportunity to detach his province from the empire and make himself an independent sovereign. The king was, indeed, accustomed to make a journey of inspection every year into one or other of his provinces, but in each province such visits were of rare occurrence, and a satrap who wished to seek his own advantage, instead of studying the interests of the king and of the empire, had every opportunity of doing so. The empire is large, he might well say to himself, and the king is far away. With a view to checking such tendencies on the part of the satraps, the Persian nobles were trained in habits of implicit obedience and subjection to the sovereign, and were kept in constant fear of being ruined by some report of treason or misgovernment on their part which should reach the ears of the king. Upon the smallest suspicion, and without any sort of trial, a man who was accused of plotting treason against the king might be removed from his post, and either openly or secretly put to death. 
A story is told of Darius I, who was one of the best of the great kings, that once, when he was about to engage in an expedition against the Scythians, a Persian noble prostrated himself before him and craved as a boon that of his three sons he might be allowed to keep one at home with him. The king answered that he should keep them all at home and gave command to put them to death immediately. In a similar manner, the people were crushed by severe and cruel laws, just as wild animals are cowed by ill treatment and want of food. As conquered nations, they were not expected to have any attachment to the king or any interest in the welfare of the empire, and, although now and again services rendered to the king would be rewarded by overwhelming favors, yet the means chiefly relied upon for securing good behavior was the certainty that every offense would meet with prompt and barbarous punishment. Not only criminals, but even persons merely suspected of having committed crimes, were put to death in the most horrible manner. Some were crushed between stones, others were torn limb from limb, and others, again, suffered painful imprisonment in troughs. For merely trifling offenses, they were cruelly mutilated. There is a Persian proverb that the king has many eyes and ears. In every state the king must have means of knowing through his trusted officers, who see and hear for him, what is going on among the people. But in Persia the arrangements for obtaining information of this kind were reduced to a science. Satraps and people alike were constantly watched by a body of spies, and so secretly was this done that it was not even known who were the officers employed. A favorite device of the spies was to feign a friendship for the person whose actions they wished to report, and a man might be arrested and executed without one suspecting the false friend who had given information of his real or imaginary guilt. Sometimes the spy would denounce an innocent man for no other reason than to bring himself into notice as active in the king's service. Another plan was to take note of everyone who passed along the roads which led from the various residences of the great king to the other principal towns of the empire. These roads were commanded by fortresses where officers were stationed whose duty it was to inquire of every wayfarer whither he was going and on what errand, and any messenger carrying a letter was obliged to give it up for inspection. This was intended to check the free passage of suspicious persons and to prevent the sending of letters not approved by the government, but it must often have been easy to find means of evading the king's officers. In order that the king might be informed as quickly as possible of any risings or disturbances in the provinces, a very complete system of postal communication had been arranged. Besides the fortresses, there were stations all along the roads, at intervals of about fifteen miles apart, where the traveler could find shelter for the night. Here the swiftest horses and horsemen were always waiting in readiness to carry on the post at full gallop without a moment's delay, whether in burning sun or blinding snow, and thus there came to be a saying that the Persian post riders fly faster than the cranes. A messenger sent from Susa to Sardis, traveling at the ordinary speed, would take a hundred days to reach his destination, but by means of the king's post a letter could be conveyed in six or seven days and nights. It must not be supposed, however, that ordinary letters were carried so fast. The king's posts were entirely reserved for the king's business, and by this means he had the advantage of getting news from the provinces and sending back his commands before anyone else knew what was going on. But, in spite of all these precautions, the king, like his subjects, lived in constant fear. He never showed himself to the people, except surrounded by his ten thousand guards. If he gave an audience, the person admitted to the royal presence was compelled, on pain of death, to present himself dressed in a robe with long sleeves falling over the hands, so that he should not be able to use his hands against his sovereign. If he entertained guests at his table, those among them who were considered the most faithful were placed at his right hand, and the less trusted at his left, because, in case of need, he would be better able to defend himself with the right hand than with the left. Each dish that was set before him was first tasted by an officer in the royal presence, lest there should be poison in the food, and in like manner, the cupbearer always drank first from the cup that he handed. Under such a system of mutual fear and distrust, the seeds of ruin and decay were sown throughout the Persian Empire, and each succeeding century saw it tottering more helplessly toward its final overthrow. But from without, everything appeared fair and prosperous, and up to the very last, the great kings were careful to maintain all the pomp and splendor of imperial power. Beyond the great Persian Empire, on the other side of the Hellespont, was the little country of Hellas or Greece. The Hellenes, or Greeks, as they are often called, 
were a race of men who had for centuries trained themselves in the art of noble thinking and noble living, and they looked down with some scorn on their less cultivated neighbors, to whom they gave, one and all, the name of barbarians. In many respects, Hellas was a complete contrast to Persia. The country was a very small one, and it was further divided into a number of tiny states, each with a free government of its own, and independent of all the rest. To the Hellene citizen, the one supreme necessity of life was freedom, and consequently, in almost all the states, the government was in the hands of men chosen by the people. Now and again a monarchy would be established in one or other of the states, but it never lasted long, and, in their horror of tyrants, the Hellenes were apt to overlook the advantages of a firm, stable government. It is true that in Hellas there were many slaves, but they formed a class apart and were in no sense citizens. The citizens themselves were free, and the Hellenes were convinced that honor, courage, and high-mindedness can only flourish among free men. It was their greatest pride to recall the battles fought by their countrymen in former days against the barbarians of Persia, when, although outnumbered by ten to one, a handful of free men had put to flight a host of slaves.